then you can pulse back down again. So we have the pulsing state. Now, on the next next thing to emphasize, looking at these uh, this hierarchy, another thing to emphasize in the hierarchy is that human hierarchies, or, or let's say natural hierarchies, tend to be nested. So there's a difference, and I, I don't think many ecologists know about this, although it's in my textbooks for years, but, but people don't read textbooks. They don't think there's anything new in textbooks, you know. <laughs> they only look, well, uh, a nested and non-nested. So uh, natural hierarchies are nested, meaning that each level is the sum of the levels below. So a ecosystem consists of a bunch of populations, you see. But human hierarchies are non-nested, which means they're more rigid. In other words, a sergeant in a military hierarchy, a sergeant is not a collection of privates, you see, or a president is not a collection of deans, you see, you know. And so, so the human hierarchies are very, uh, very uh, sharp, and it's difficult to move between them. And it would be better if human hierarchies are like natural, natural hierarchies, where it's easy to move between the levels, and you don't have the rigidity of it. So that's just another little point we make where maybe we could learn uh, better how to operate our hierarchical system by seeing how nature does it. In this case, maybe nature does it better than we do. Sometimes we can do better than nature. I mean, all of this is up to them. So, so now, now this little diagram is a, this is now just has three boxes and there were three levels in the hierarchy. We have cellular levels, organism levels, and ecological levels. That's where we're compressing this. And the point we make here is uh, there are some functions that are the same all over the hierarchy, and there's some that are not. There's some that are different for different things. And so it's important to find out which of these general functional things uh, we call the functional things that are, that are present in all environments. We speak of them as contingents or, transit, or, or, or transcend. These are transcendental functions. They transcend. All, all the levels. And so we asked, what are some of those? And now this, this one has more information than you can see at one time. But this one here in this statement here uh, says it transcends some of the transcending functions. And these are things that are important no matter what level you're working in, whether you're level to work in molecular level or whether you're working in ecosphere. These are things that you ought to be aware of. And our idea is environmental education should start with these common denominator functions first, and then go to the details later. Well, here are some of the transcending functions. Energetics. The laws of thermodynamics are the same whether you're dealing with molecules or whether you're dealing with whole systems. Uh, cycling. Cycling is a basic part. We have Krebs cycles, you know, in the cell level, and we have biogeochemical cycles in the other. So everything cycles in any level and that required the renewal and recycle. That's a basic thing. It occurs everywhere in every every discipline, everything you want. Uh, and then evolution. Many people would deny this, but evolution occurs at all levels. It doesn't stop with the individual, as many biologists think. Uh, evolution occurs at ecosystem level. For instance, the evolution of mutualism. You see where unrelated organisms evolve to work together for the common good. That's evolution. And that's to, is important or more important than the evolution of individuals. So we say uh, those psychologists who think evolution is the only uh, thing is important, that's true, but they're only thinking of it as stopping that evolution is, has to stop with genetic relationships. But there's a lot of evolution going on where there's no genetic relationship at all. And then development, growth. Everything grows and stops growing. <laughs> Everything grows to a point and then quits. Uh, or if it doesn't, if it continues to grow beyond any limits, then it, it crashes. Okay. Uh, regulation. We just talked about that. Cybernetics. And that one changes, as we point out. Changes from set point to non-set point. So that's a transition function that changes. Diversity. Not just species diversity. In fact, I don't think species diversity is important as environmental habitat diversity because of future of our Earth depends on maintaining diversity of the ecosystem, not just having a whole bunch of species. You can have too many cooks in the kitchen, you know. Okay. And then uh, we have integration, competition, mutualism, merging properties, and all of that. So our vignette for all of that, of course, is that uh, <coughs> the whole is always more than the sum of the parts. 
And so we need to have in our science people who are working from top down. You start with looking at the whole thing, and then you see what pieces you want to have more information on, whereas the traditional scientist is to try to look for that ultimate particle, that ultimate small thing, which is supposed to explain everything, such as DNA. <laughs> uh, and, of course, it doesn't. It, it, it helps a great deal, but it does not. Okay, now, so now what I want to do then for the next few times uh, is to go into some details about these contingent, uh, these transient or transcending uh, functions. And here, here are some examples. One, which we, I, I'll just read these off. This would be on the overhead of the publication. Uh, first one we've already talked about, and that is a transition from set point to non-set point cybernetics, from homeostasis to homeoresis. In other words, these, uh, the title of all these is Concepts of Systems Behavior Showing Which One Changes with Scale. Scale does matter. Big is not the same as small. Okay. And the se second one we've already mentioned, and that is a pulsing paradigm. The balance of nature is a pulsing one, not a steady-state equilibrium. Get that through your head. It's, don't expect nature to ever be the same all the time. But it does pulse within certain limits. It can get out of limit. And we, we haven't learned that yet. We think that, that we can keep on going straight line. Nothing is ever straight line. Goes, everything is a humpback curve. In other words, the increasing of, uh, benefits of scale, which economists love to talk about the more you make the cheaper they are you know we know that's not true look at automobiles <laughs> they were pretty expensive when they were handmade and they got cheaper when the machine made but now look at them <laughs> they get terribly expensive uh, as we make too complicated ones and too bigger ones and too much of them and so on and so forth and then the and the third one we haven't talked about i mean th these are all to me the exciting big picture parts of the new ecology and things that old ecologists or average ecologists or traditional biology ecologists don't ever consider or don't even know about. And this one is uh, enrichment, eutrophication, uh, increases productivity. That's why we put all the fertilizers on the fields and so on. But unlike what many people believe, it reduces diversity because when you fertilize something, there's always a op opportunistic or it's, a, or it's a crop you want to grow that benefits. So you increase dominance. And when you increase dominance, then you, you, you have less room left for all the species. So all this biodiversity bunk and stuff we hear about, you see, the uh, way, way we, worst thing we do about that is we're fertilizing the world and we kill a lot of systems that are very diverse. Coral reef is a good example. Uh, if you fertilize a coral reef, it gets polluted. Then filamentous algae, which love this kind of environment, form a mat over it and kill the reef completely. In other words, the reef is adopted, like most natural systems, is adopted for low nutrient environments. The average natural environment is not enriched. All the, in, all the, all the nutrients, phosphorus and nitrogen, are in use. There's no surplus of stuff out there. And so a fully uh, operation community is more or less invasion proof. Because the, the other thing here, which is that eutrophication brings on pests and dangerous diseases. That That's pretty radical. Uh, that, I, that, that I think is true. We can argue about it. 